And here we are for another episode of That Rocks. Welcome, everybody. It's Eddie Trunk, along with my partners, Don Jameson, Jim Florentine. Thank you for joining us as uh, we get ready to join you for another show, Talking Rock with you and bringing you a great guest and hanging out and answering some of your questions, covering some of the topics in the world of rock. Hope everybody had a great week. And uh, again, go back and check out all our old episodes as well. There's about, um, I always forget, I lose count. What are we at, like 15, 14? What number is this, Jim? 16. Yeah, 16, 16, please. 16. Yeah. So we already got a bank of 15 shows for you guys to check out on demand. If you're just joining us, you're just hearing about the show, because every day I'm hearing from people saying they're just discovering that we're doing this. There's uh, 14, 15 old episodes to go check out and a lot of great guests as we continue to build this. And we appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. What's going on, Donnie boy? How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, Joe, you're fired. Just want to get that out of the way at the top of Already? the show. Already? Yeah. Joe, um, Joe blew a bit for Don. Andy can uh, Andy could stay. Good. I so, uh, so I I made a return uh, visit to uh, to see Glenn Hughes again, and uh, as per, as as per usual, um, he was brilliant. Um, uh, in New York City at the Palladium and uh, sang his ass off. Uh, really, you know, really pushed it, man. Uh, I think a lot of people get worked up when they come and play in New York. Uh, but he had to do a shorter set this time because he was uh, with Ingve and their tour has officially begun. And so Ingve also came out and did a, a headlining set. And uh, just a, a great night overall. It was super loud, really well attended. And uh, everyone sounded great. So that was uh, a lot of fun. That was actually last night. So uh, good times. And they're did out I, on the road for like a month. Don, did I both go on? Did I both do the same amount of time? Is there an opening band before Glenn goes on? Yeah. So on the whole tour, there'll be a, a local band opening. Glenn do, doing about about an hour and five minutes. It's the Deep, you know, the deep Purple 50th Anniversary of Burn show. And then Ingve coming out doing all the Ingve stuff that you would expect from him. And, uh, you know, he didn't hold back either. Not that he's ever been known to hold back. Is it equal sets, though? Do they play the same amount of time? Uh, uh, I think Ingbe was a, maybe a t about five or ten minutes longer. And uh, is Glenn set with Ingve? Is it only Burn, or does he do anything else? No, no, he does He does songs from other areas, but he f focuses more on that album. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what is it? Did you watch all of Ingve? Most of it. Is yeah. he doing like they're calling it his hits? Is he doing yeah. anything like is he doing all this stuff from like the early records or what's his set like? Yeah, it. I mean, for what you could consider Ingve's hits, yeah, that that pretty much the, what I took from it is yeah, and you know he did a, he did a lot of the old stuff and um, and obviously plenty of plenty of improvisation and shredding and uh, flicking picks and uh, yeah, he looked like he was in good form, man. But is because uh, we talk for people that don't know, both Glenn and Ingve were on recent episodes. So you can go back and watch them. They were on separately. Did uh, th uh, those guys talk? Ingve talked about figuring out something where he would do a, sh a song with Glenn during his set. That didn't happen in New York. It did not happen. So that is, that is yet to happen. But maybe down the line, who knows? Like I said, they're out for at they're out for another full month together. So that w that would be killer. You know, because I think Ingve did play a Deep Purple song at the end of his set, one that Glenn isn't doing. So that would be sort of a natural if Glenn wanted to jump up there and do that. Yeah, yeah, you would think. And they talked about working that out. But uh, we'll see. Hopefully this goes smoothly. I mean, these are two two guys with big personalities who uh, have a lot of history and of legendary status. And that can go one of two ways when uh, people like that get on the road together. It seemed like there's a lot of mutual respect, but hopefully that holds through the run of the dates. We'll see. Well, the fans win because, you know, obviously both of them need to bring their best. You know, Glenn, tough act to follow, of course. And, uh, you know, it is it is sort of a, a, strain, a strange bill because, um, you know, even though Glenn's a phenomenal uh, bass player, you know, it's his vocal acrobatics that people really dig from him and then you got Ingve with the guitar heroics so um but people the, the place was full and i didn't see a lot of people leave after glenn so you know hopefully it works out 
All right, John, uh, Jim, you saw Fogarty, right? Yeah, I saw John Fogarty down in Atlantic City. It's the third time I've seen him like the last seven years. I think he's 77 now. It's all speaking of all real live vocals. I mean, he's got a couple. His he's got two sons in the band. Him and his one of his sons on guitar. They do this guitar licks back and forth. It's amazing. And uh, you know, there's no backup female singers. It's just John singing. His one of his sons will go up and sing a little backup on some backup parts. But other than that, it's just him out there in a flannel. Which, by the way, he he sells his blue flannel that says John Fogan for a hundred bucks. It's August, and he's wearing a flannel. Oh yeah, yeah, that's his thing. He has to wear a flannel. And then at the merchandise table, the hundred bucks. I almost bought it. I'm like, I could get that at Kohl's for like eight bucks. The same <laughs> exactly. color, blue. And just uh, write but, John Fogarty on it in the, with a sharpie. Yeah, uh, but he was great. I mean, all all the hits, and a lot of visuals, and telling you know stories after every song. He was kept mentioning he got some of his songs back. I thought he had them all back. You know, because I've seen him before, but he's saying he just got him back. He said he had to wait for people to die to get him back. So Was it mostly CCR? Yeah. Yeah, he did like four solo songs. Yeah, I haven't seen Fogarty play in a long time, but I saw him when uh, he first started doing CCR again back years ago, like 20 years ago, at what was the op grand opening of a venue still in New York called Hammerstein Ballroom. And at that point, nobody knew if he was going to do CCR. And I was like, I don't want to go if he's not doing CCR. And he did. And it was amazing. For people that don't know that story, I mean, Fogarty's legend. I mean, even as a little kid, I had CCR records on 45. But um, Saul Zantz was the name of the guy that owned his record label and basically fleeced him out of all his publishing and all of his money. So as a protest to that guy, he refused to play any of the Creedence songs, which is crazy because they're his songs and that's what everybody wants to hear. But he wouldn't do it as a protest to screw over Saul Zantz, who we had this huge, huge dispute with. And they ended up cutting some deal. And he, the reference he's probably making, he had to wait till somebody died, is I think Saul Zantz died. So I think that's why he probably some stuff reverted to him. But it's crazy to think all those Creedence songs, Fogarty's the sole songwriter on all of them. And he, you know, he didn't have control of his own catalog. He lost a ton of money. Now, was he going to get royalties, that guy Saul, every time he yeah. played them live? So he didn't want to give him any more money. He didn't, he just didn't want to do anything to even call attention to it, which is kind of silly because obviously everybody knows they're his songs and they're heard on the radio, but he just didn't want to do anything that was going to be like, promoting CCR in any way because he got no piece of it or he got a tiny piece of it. So it's it was a really, really long uh, drama. There's a song. So on that center field record, there's the song uh, Old Man, Old Down, Man the Down the Road, which is a re basically a rewrite of a Creedence song. And there's also a song called Zance Can't Dance, which was a shot at this guy, Saul Zance, who he claims stole all his money. So yeah, there was a long history. I haven't seen, you know, I think I mentioned this last week. James Lomenzo played with Fogarty for years yeah. until he got the gig with Megadeth. He only left to go play with Megadeth. But Megadeth. I had a chance to go see him a few times with James. And again, just didn't line up. But that's cool that you got a chance to see him. I thought, Eddie, he had a, I thought he had a problem with his brother, too, John Fogarty in the band. And that's why, that was one of the reasons why he didn't play the songs. I don't know the whole story. I think, he, well, he had a problem with the other guy. The other guys in the band went and did and still do a band called Credence Clearwater Revisited. So CCR instead of Revival Revisited. And it's the other one or two guys from Credence. And obviously that's not something he's probably pretty happy about either. But I don't know. He's amazing still as a singer and he still looks great. For What would you say? He's 77? I'm pretty sure he's 77. Yeah. Guy still looks amazing. If you ever see him, I've seen him on TV. It's crazy. But Eddie, Eddie, that's uh, the old man down the road thing is is even crazier than what you what you mentioned because it's a rewrite of Run Through the Jungle. Right. Just you know, totally different lyrics, but it's the same exact riff. And Saul sued him for stealing his song, and he right. lost. So really? That yes. he wrote <laughs> <laughs> the song right. he wrote. Saul owned, so Saul, it's my song. I'm suing you for my song, for rewriting my song, and he won. Saul won or, or Fogarty Saul. won? Saul, Saul won. won. <laughs> That's by the way, rock and roll, baby. <laughs> by the way, real quick, Jim made a point about the shirts. I, I think everybody's got that figured out by now. Like, if you just go to Target 
You're going to get the same shirt they're trying to charge you for $90 for at the concert for 15 like maybe even better, maybe even better quality, and you don't have to carry it. You don't have to worry about beer or cigarettes getting on it. And um, look, I hate it'd be great if you bought the stuff at the venues because it helps support the artist. So I'm not saying that, but here's why those shirts are so expensive at gigs because the venue is taking a cut. So the venue could be taking anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, which is why if the artist wants to charge you 40, they got to mark it up to like 70 to get 40. So yeah. the way around that, we talked about ticketing, I think. I get confused because I do a ton of shows a week, but I know we talked about how to work ticketing. I mean, you do the same stuff with merch. I mean, I know people want to be in it and say they got the shirt at the thing, but if you can, you can go online and get the stuff for a fraction of the cost. Yeah. It was or, 50 It was fifty bucks for a T-shirt. What was the flannel, though? A hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, even, I, don't even, I don't even have that much money in Cole's cash to buy it for 100 <laughs> I got I a Marilyn Manson flannel. I think you got one too, Jim, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. Manson flannel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't um, fit me anymore. But, but you no, know, you know, I see uh, like a lot of the smaller bands now that are doing like Dingbats and Clifton, New Jersey, or smaller rock clubs are selling the merch, merchandise at their bus. They go come around back to the fans. We'll just sell it so the venue doesn't get a cut. Not not exactly Dingbats, but a lot of venues are like, you know what, we'll screw them. Just come around back and we'll sell you the stuff. I love that. That beat the yeah. system. I mean, the cooler clubs at, at that level won't take a cut, or if they do, it's very small because they know those bands aren't making any money and that merch can be the difference between them putting gas in their van or not. It's really important. So the smaller clubs don't, but at the higher levels, I mean, it's just insane the the merch and the cut that the venues take. And that's why so many times it gets marked up to these ridiculous amounts. Um, I don't know any, anything else really going on as far as news. It's It's been um, a pretty light news week. I think with the holiday weekend coming up, people are sort of winding down, checking out a little bit. We should mention, though, uh, tying in with the holiday weekend, that we are going to take a week off for the holiday. So we will not be on with a new show next week. It's a long holiday weekend here in the U.S. with Labor Day weekend coming up. We just ripped off like 15, 16 straight of these things. So we're going to take uh, next week off. And keep an eye on our social medias and everything, and we will let you know about the uh, return show after the holiday week and and when we're back on, what day and time it's going to be, and who the guests will be. So keep an eye on that rock show on all the social media or our individual accounts, and as usual, we'll keep you posted on all updates about the show. All yep. right, let's get into our stuff then. Yeah, let's do this. So... Um, what do we do? So okay, so by. we didn't even mention our guest. So our yeah. guest joining us in like 15 minutes is our our mutual, our good, good buddy and a regular on our old TV show, Mike Portnoy. We've been looking to get him on uh, since we started, but Mike is literally in a bunch of different bands and has been all over the country. But we got him home in the U.S. He's already checked in with us. He's the first guest we ever had who was professional enough to do a sound check. <laughs> So Mike is ready to go, and we're going to bring him on in about 15 minutes. But you know, one of the things Mike is very well known for is playing with a lot of people and a very diverse amount of people in his history. And we are going to uh, talk a little bit about that with him, but we're also going to talk about side projects in general. And our metal six-pack this week on That Rocks is the six – your six favorite side projects, meaning not the primary band from these artists, but a side project. Yeah. So uh, who starts? Jim, you start at six? I'll start. I think I, I I probably got it wrong. I don't know. I thought it was just top six bands that Mike's been in. What? But why didn't our producer um, correct you on that? I don't know. But Twisted Sister is my number six. But I'm Wait, wrong. Jim, so. hold on. You're doing, all, you're doing six bands that Mike's been in? Yeah. The top six bands that he's been in that I like that that was I I misread the look you can't blame it on producer Joe blame it on me I I read that I go okay it's the top six bands and all three of I you picked. did something different yeah it's no big deal whatever are, are we gonna get in trouble is Mike gonna be mad at us I'm my it's number six is Mike. sister it just I know, blows but, out the whole theme look at Don 
I say we. Skip, what did you I do, Don? This train wreck before it even. Happened. No, just go. All right, twisted sister. I, you know, I, I'm going to ask Mike if they're going to ever do shows again. There you go. There's Don's pick. But Don, what's the theme of your six? Yeah, what's your theme? That's my theme. <laughs> I like my theme better. I think my that theme was works. Your theme I was talked about. But I suggested yeah. the, the theme that, that Jim did, and then, Eddie, you you overruled it. So I didn't overrule it. I just brought up the other thing. We said, yeah, let's do that. So my number six is a band called Spirit Adrift. Um, the, the guitar player and vocalist in Spirit Adrift, his name is Nate Garrett. His primary band is the death metal band Gate Creeper. All right, so Nate's day job is in Gate Creeper playing death metal. Spirit of Drift is not death metal. Spirit of Drift is very classic sounding heavy metal. This is just a straight up heavy metal band uh, with very strong songwriting, cool vocals, dual guitar attack. Um, th they finally put out a full length album, um, and that'll, if we get to our picks, um, it's going to be mine for this week. So that's my number six. If you haven't checked out Spirit of Drift, they are really, really good. They got a, a handful of EPs out and now a full length. Go ahead. John, what is the theme of your six? Just six sidebands? Six sidebands. Okay, so that's what I'm doing too. So Jim's six are all bands Portnoy's been in. Don and, and I, our six, it's just six bands that are side projects having nothing to do with Mike, whether he is or isn't involved. What's right. my number six, Joe? Put it up because I forget. Um, okay, well, that's a photo of Extreme. But obviously, the side band that it was is a band called Morning Widows. And, and really, more generally, any side stuff that Nuno has done, I've been a fan of. He had a band called Population One. He had a band called Satellite Party with Perry Farrell. If you've never, he had a solo record called Schizophonic. But if you've never heard Morning Widows, that is kick ass stuff. There's a couple records out there. So basically, even though that's a photo of Extreme, uh, the, the, my, my band is side bands from Nuno. And Nuno and Gary were both on this show earlier, by the way. Yep. All right. My number five is uh, top. Mike Portnoy band is Flying Circus. No, I think I it's say. Flying Colors. Yeah. Mike's not even in the picture. Flying, it's Flying Colors. So The band's called Flying Colors. Maybe the record's called Circus. I don't know that band that well. No. And Mike's not even in that picture. <laughs> this is this <laughs> Maybe, is got, maybe got propped out. Maybe got cropped out. This is death. All right. Don, what's that? My number five is <laughs> Nine Pound Hammer. And By the, the way, you do realize you do realize that this is people's favorite part of this entire of course, show. When, it's we, perfect. when we go when we go off the rails, you do realize. I hear that constantly. So, I, I, I as ridiculous and pathetic as we are, people no. enjoy our pathetic. Not, I've not, not one comment has I read that said that. All right, then um, we just suck. Who's the, who's that? And also, number five? and also, there's no such band as Morning Wood or whatever you said. I Morning told, Widows. You made that. You made that up. Nobody you want me to go get the CDs? <laughs> Nobody ever heard. of Wait that here, band. and I'll get the CDs. I, I never heard of that band once. Wait here. Six years. All right. By the way, Nine Pound Hammer has one of my favorite songs. Uh, we done run out of worms on their debut album. <laughs> yes, yes. One of the greatest titles. We done run out of worms. Yeah, and and, and you see a picture there of. Agree, Jim, um, of Blaine Cartwright, whose primary band is Nashville Pussy. But um, uh, Nine Pound Hammer is very different. It's kind of, you know, countrified, Kentucky, uh, booze-soaked, um, you know, rock and roll with, with very tongue-in-cheek lyrics. And uh, they've got a bunch of albums out. I was hoping, he, uh, Blaine's sending all of us um, the new Nine Pound Hammer hoping to have it to, to show off to the camera but uh that'll be my, one of my picks later on in the season i don't eddie you know now he's taking a cd and he's writing morning wood on it you know <laughs> like that's a real bit nobody on earth ever heard of morning wood i had it i had it this morning yeah <laughs> well I, let's not show that um so that's that's my number five is and we'll skip eddie's number five jim go to your number four because it's probably right. a made-up band 
my number four um well you know what if you're gonna do this i could just uh, i'm gonna go murder dolls even though this isn't the murder dolls we're doing side project it was joey jordanson and wednesday 13. There you their go. side project it was one i picked a few weeks ago one of my favorite two right well the, especially the debut one they put out two records joey yeah. played guitar uh, in the band and uh, it was a lot of older wednesday 13 songs the first record the second one was great but yeah they were on roadrunner so that's my number four even though yeah. wednesday or joey's not in that picture no, which but I yeah, okay. Women and Eddie. Children Last is a great album too. Yeah, yeah, Murder Dolls. So, Ed, we skipped your number four. Mm -hmm. Why? That's your number five. Oh, your number five. That's my number five, which is Tremonti, Mark Tremonti from Alter Bridges, side band, very heavy. Uh, a extremely young Wolfgang Van Halen in that band at one point. Tremonti has made like four or five solo records simply under that name. Very heavy stuff. Great stuff. Tremonti, my five side project, Mark Tremonti of Alter Bridges and Creed's side band. Where's the Morning Wood CD? I, there's so many M's, <laughs> bands that start with an M. Doesn't that exist. If you want, I'm going to be over there for like 10 minutes to go through all the M's, but I will go do it if you ask me. Doesn't exist. My number right. four... Find the sleeve, please, for me, Joe, for Morning Widows, spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Furnish Souls for Rent is the name of one of the records, you son of a bitch, Don. Right, he could just find the, the graphic online. Right. Yeah, he'll not, he won't find it. All Number right. four is, is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses and his side band, Hookers and Blow. And there's the beautiful vinyl. Um, I This I love because... They've been doing hookers and blow for 20 years. I've, I've toured with them a bunch. Um, and there you uh, go. There's the album cover. Hey, you want to buy it, Don? Go ahead, buy yourself a copy. It's fantastic. It's for sale. He just eleven dollars. He, he just typed that up. Hookers, <laughs> hookers and blow is the is the greatest side. Band it's AI. Ever. It's it's a band that's that's based on the premise, and it's it's Dizzy Mike Duda from Wasp. Uh, Alex Grassi from Quiet Ride and Johnny Kelly on drums. And it's a, the entire concept is based on that they will never, ever write one original song. Um, so if you get the Hookers and Blow album, it's all cover songs. They're a cover band. And G God bless Dizzy Reed. He goes out with Guns N' Roses, plays for 75,000 people a night. He's home for two days. And we get in a 15-passenger van and play for 75 people in small clubs and um, he loves every minute of it. So that's my number four, an actual side band that exists, Hookers mm. and Blow. <laughs> Mike Portnoy's not in that, though. <laughs> he might be. All right. Th my number four is the Joe Perry Project. Ah. Uh, that is uh, a recent picture, which, again, there's an extreme theme here because that's Gary Sharon singing with Joe in that particular photo. So that's from a very recent tour. But um, the first two Joe Perry Project records, the first album, Let the Music Do the Talking, is incredible. Yeah. Still among the most listened to records for me, and it's like 44 years old. Amazing raw record. Obviously, Joe Perry from Aerosmith, his side band that he fires up every once in a while. Love the project. All right, my number three, speaking of Dizzy Reed, even though he's not in this picture, um, his solo record that he put out a few years ago was amazing. That was probably better than Chinese Democracy. Like, if those songs were Chinese that Democracy. That was a great record. It was way it was, better than Chinese Democracy. Yeah. If right? those songs on Dizzy's record came out called Guns N' Roses with Axel singing them, it would have been huge. They were amazing songs, and yeah. I know it took them a long time. I sang backup vocals on one of the songs. You did? Yeah, I went in the studio, yeah. I nice. forget what song. It's been a while, but whatever. But I know he worked on that for like four or five years and put it oh. out. It kind of got lost in the mix, but the great stuff on there. Yeah. What band Rock is that with Mike Orlando with eyeliner on? Adrenaline Mob. Yeah. That's Adrenaline Mob? Oh, probably one version of it. Yeah. Yeah. I never saw I never saw those guys rocking that look, but Yeah, I don't I don't think that's Adrenaline Mob either. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I why is right? It's it's morning wood. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, number three. Widows. Number Widows. three is uh, is our buddy Glenn Hughes, who's been on the show with us. Uh, you know, obviously 
besides his solo career, he's got Black Country Communion, who, who is pictured there. He's also got California Breed, the Dead Daisies. So, you know, Glenn's uh, sort of the master of um, the side band, and he's my number three. I forgot about Black Country Communion qualifying as a side project, but that's a good one. Dead Daisies no more because he's not in it anymore. Right, but um, he, it was. Right. My number three is Last in Line, side yep. project for Vivian Campbell. Talk about going from playing in Normo Domes to clubs and vans. That's exactly what Vivian does with this band. Andrew Freeman, an incredible singer. Phil Susan on bass. Vinny Apice, who has a bunch of different bands, but really this is the side thing for Vivian because he's in Def Leppard. Uh, they've made, uh, they make uh, original music. They got three, four albums out, including a new album called Jericho. And they also play the hell out of early Dio material, the first two albums, because obviously Vivian and Vinny are original members of the Dio band. So there you go. Last in line for me at number three. All right. My number two, even though uh, D is not in here, is Widowmaker. I love that. Uh, what? When he came back. Jim's, Jim's calling audibles on the fly. I'm calling audibles. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, just coming up with them. Yeah. Widowmaker, they put out two records. Who was the guitar player again? Was that, I forget. Bernie in that band. That's right. Bernie, yeah. Who played an Ozzy for nine days until he got uh, tossed to the side for Brad Gillis. But uh, those, those are great records. Really heavy, de totally different than Twisted Sister. So what you're saying is we're disregarding what the photo is and just listening to what Jim says. Well, yeah, I'm making them up because I didn't know, you know. Because that's didn't... a picture of Dream Theater without Portnoy. <laughs> it looks like Widowmaker a little bit. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, let's get through this. Yeah, <laughs> my number two. My number two is uh, is Mike Patton. Um, as I mean, come on. The guy, obviously, Faith No More is his primary band, but Mr. Bumble, Tomahawk, Phantomas, Moonchild Trio, Kata Patton, Dead Cross, Lovage, Mondo Kane, Peeping Tom, just to name a few of Mike Patton's side bands. That's a picture of the current version of Mr. Bumble. I don't think Bumble. any of those bands exist. They, they, they all exist, um, but, um, but... Never heard of half of them. But you, know this, but you know this band exists because Scott Ian is in it. Scott Ian has many side projects, too. No, he doesn't. He does. You go. Me, number two, is yeah. uh, Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. Uh, I love this band. Of course, for a while, this was Slash's only band. When he rejoined Guns N' Roses, it now became his side band. Miles Kennedy, Brent Fitz, Todd Kearns, Frank Sidoris, Love their original music. Love what they do live as well. I'm really glad that Slash didn't abandon this completely when he rejoined GNR. And love this band. Love these guys personally. Love the music they make. And they are killer live as well. That's my number two. All right. My number one is, um, I don't see Corey Taylor in here, but uh, Stone Sour. <laughs> <laughs> That's the winery dogs. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was my favorite Portnoy band. Over yeah, Dream Theater, right. that Billy was my Jean pick. Looks a little like Corey in the, that A little bit, yeah. But um, yeah. you know, the Stone Sour thing, there was some kind of drama went down. Corey doesn't want to do it anymore, so he's doing his own solo, <laughs> Corey motherfucker Taylor <laughs> band. But um, those those first three Stone Sour records are great. Agreed. Um, my number one is the king of all side bands, Mike Portnoy. Um, I listen at some point. All these bands were, were side bands to another band. And I should add, we'll definitely ask him what he thinks his primary band is now. I would say it's the Winery Dogs. But at some point, the Adrenaline Mob, Avenged Sevenfold, Transatlantic, Yellow Matter Custard, Flying Colors, or Flying Circus, the Winery Dogs, Liquid Tension Experiment, mm -hmm. Metal Legion, Sons of Apollo, Neil, Neil Morse Band, all side bands, once again, just to name a few, no one more king of side bands than Mike. He's what witty. band is that in the picture? It doesn't matter. It's Corey Taylor. <laughs> I, I think that's Adrenaline Mob. Yeah, this that's Adrenaline Mob um, before Mike Orlando wore eyeliner. So there's, but there's, it doesn't matter what picture you put up there. He's in, <laughs> he's in forty of them. So that's, that's what the I'm wrong saying. picture. Oh, come on, we got you know. Let's get this right. Did you want the picture? 
Oh boy. The, the fans are attacking Mr. Russo now. I'm sorry. All right, let's get this over with. Where's my, what am I, number one? All right, so that is a picture of the winery dogs. They are my number one sideband. I don't even know if they still qualify as a sideband because some of them would tell you it's still it's now their primary band, but all three of those guys do a million different things. And I've got a lot of history with them, and I love them to death. Billy, Mike, and Richie, three albums out now. I saw a bunch of shows with them recently, and they would be my number one if you if they even qualify as a side band. But judging what we did today, my gosh, anything qualifies. So that's my, my number one. That Winery Dogs is my number one too. We had the same number one, Eddie. <laughs> Wait, isn't that isn't that Mike Orlando on the on the left? <laughs> Let's bring in Mike and see what he thinks. Yeah, I think it's I think Winery Dogs is my, I would say that's his primary band, but he might have a different opinion. I don't know. I, I mean, maybe his primary rock band. I don't know. Is Mike with us yet? Because he, if not, he, yeah, he bailed. He bailed on us twenty minutes ago. <laughs> on a train wreck. You got. It's nice to see you guys have gotten your shit together after all these years. <laughs> Did you watch that train wreck? Yes. What the hell is wrong with you guys? It's <laughs> unbelievable. And believe it or not, we plan this out and we talk about it. Well, can I play? I want to do a a, a six pack. Can I do this? Or yeah. Not? Yeah. But you know, what is it going to be? Well, wait. Tell us what your category is. Uh, well, I'll do yours and Don's category, which is top six side projects in general, not not of mine. All right. Please do. Uh, I guess I'm going backwards order. My number one. And I can't believe none of you guys mentioned it. S.O.D., Stormtroopers of Death. Uh, I wasn't was, into S.O.D. That was the original side project. That That's was like right. the first one. Uh, yeah. Back in 85, I saw them uh, I saw them opening for uh, Motorhead and Wendy Williams and uh, the Cro-Mags at the Ritz back in 85, Christmas of 85. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I might even like S.O.D. even more than uh, a lot of the Anthrax albums. I'm just a huge fan of those guys. Well, that's, that's why well, that's why S.O.D. had to go away. Right. <laughs> Trust well, me, I was work I was working for those guys at the time at Megaforce, and that S.O.D. record, which was more of a hardcore thing, got so popular it became a little bit of a threat to Anthrax. So right. they kind of put it to bed. Well, Mike, that would have been my number one if I knew how to play the game right. <laughs> and Mike's not even and Mike's not even playing the game right because who starts at number one? That's a, uh, that's like that's like coming before you have sex. You got well, to build up to it. Bro. Who doesn't do that? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> uh, what else do I got? I got well, uh, as I think Don mentioned. Uh, Mr. Bungle. I mean, I love Mr. Bungle. I mean, it's it's what it's hard to say what's a side project and what's a real band. After a while, I mean, Mr. Bungle, you guys are still dying. Because I'm thinking of Jim knocking one out before he <laughs> get that one out of the way. Preemptive strike. Yeah. It's a, what is it? It's like there's, something about, gun. there's something about Mary, right? You don't want to go yes. in with a loaded gun. Or... Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm laughing. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Mike. All right. <laughs> the, the angelic Mike Portnoy. So Mr. Bungle, my number two is Mr. Bungle, which Good. actually, you know, they existed before Faith No More. So, I oh. mean, which is which is the real band and which is the side project? Who knows? But then uh, same with uh, Stone Sour. Stone Sour existed before Corey was in Slipknot. So Stone Sour would be on my list, who I, I actually played with. I did a gig with them. So I guess that could kind of fit into Jim's game. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I have Down, Phil Anselmo's oh, Down, yeah. which uh, for a while Rex was in the band with him as well. And I love those albums. Yeah, Pepper from CLC. Uh, then this is more of a metal, hard rock, hip hop crossover, but the Prophets of Rage project, which right. was Audio Slave with Chuck D and Be Real uh, fronting them. Yep. My number six, I'll put one of my own on there because this is a side project for so many people. It's Metal Allegiance. And that's my metal outlet, my thrash metal outlet. And it's obviously a side project for for Alex Skolnick, David Ellison, Mark Asagata, Bobby Blitz, Gary Holt, Andreas Kisser. I mean, you know, pretty much everybody has worked with us in the Metal Allegiance through the years. So that's kind of a fun thrash metal side project for all of us are you still doing that you haven't yeah. done that in a long time 
No, we have. We 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 do a few per year. We we just played uh, at Rock and Rio uh, last September. I mean, that was huge, enormous gig for us. And uh, we have uh, we usually play um, in Anaheim around the NAM show. We haven't done that the last couple of years because of COVID, but uh, we are scheduled to do it again this coming January. So yeah, it, that was we, called Hail, right? Originally. No, that was a different thing. Hail was something that I did with David Ellison, Andreas, and Ripper. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that was before Metal Allegiance. Metal Allegiance kind of was the same idea, which was just doing covers. But then, of, of course, we've now done two albums of original material. So now, if you see Metal Allegiance now, it's kind of like half and half. Half original, half covers. So Mike was totally unprepared and had no clue we were doing this and came up with a much better cohesive list <laughs> than the three of us who planned this out, of course. So you, you guys need did, to know. You, you didn't mention Velvet Revolver. You, you didn't, oh, there's tons. You didn't mention Infectious Grooves. You didn't mention uh, Temple of the Dog. I mean, there are tons. That was a good one. Yeah. yeah. But Eddie, lot, Eddie, I, had to, Eddie had to make one up. Morning well, Widows is not made up. You never, Mike, you know Mike, Morning you Widows, Morning right? Windows? No, I know Widowmaker. I don't oh, know Morning Jesus. I'm going to yeah. get Yeah, see, I don't, I don't know, know either. either. Widowmaker. And Everyone watching knows Morning Widows, so the hell with all you. And then you had two, you had a picture of Adrenaline Mob with the original lineup with Rich Ward in there, which was, which was pretty short-lived. But then there was another one. When Jim was doing his list, there was a picture of, Supposed to have been Adrenaline Mob, but I don't know who the fuck it was. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a band with Mike Orlando wearing eyeliner. I don't know who it was. Yeah, and then you had Dream Theater, but without... A, without, without you. Yeah. <laughs> this whole segment went completely off the rails. I don't know what the fuck you guys are doing. <laughs> exactly. We don't either. But, it, works but, be it works better that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, for, so, Mike, for you, what... What is your primary band at this point in your life? Is it Winery Dogs? Is it the Mike Morse band? What What, what is it? The Mike, 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 Mike Morse. Mike Morse. <laughs> Neil Morse. That's a friend of ours, Mike Morse. Yeah. Oh my God. Or is it Morning Wood? Which band? <laughs> it's Adrenaline Circus. <laughs> or no, Flying Circus. Yeah, Flying and then Circus. Sons of Flying Apollo Mom. was up there at some point. Nobody even mentioned the name. That was Sons of Apollo, one of the photos. But what was Flying Circus? No, you're thinking of Flying Colors, which is I know, but he had a horse. He had a cover that said "Flying." Put the cover right. up if you can, Joe. I don't know what that is. No, yeah. flying, that was, I guess, the band Flying Circus. I don't know, but I, <laughs> my band was Steve Morse and Neil Morse is is uh, Flying Colors, and we've done three albums. So, you know, at what point is something no longer a side project and a real band? When you have, I've done three albums with Liquid Tension Experiment, uh, three with the Winery Dogs, three with Flying Colors. So at some point. You know, I, I don't know. There's a fine line between side project and real band. Hey, Mike, let me. I brought this up to you before, and I, uh, yeah, I don't know. What that is. that has nothing to do with Mike. Although, Mike, that does look like a band you would be in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Can we Photoshop Mike in there? Mike yeah, might join that band now. He might I add know. a new band. <laughs> Flying Circus, if you need a drummer, we know a guy. He'd fit right in. <laughs> but, Mike, we were talking about – I've said this to you a lot in the past. So when you left Dream Theater because you wanted to play in a bunch of different bands and do all this diverse, different music, you, we all know you caught a lot of hell for it initially. And at that time uh, – I was saying this on my radio show. Like, back when we were kids – if a member of a band went and did something else in a side band, it was looked at as like, oh, my God, the, the sky's falling. It was like right. a huge thing. I mean, and it was a sign of a red out. flag and all that. Now it's the norm. And yeah. you caught some shit about it initially. And now everyone does it. Like, I can't think of anybody that doesn't at least have one other band on the right. side. Totally. Do you feel a little, like, vindicated because you kind of kicked the door open in some ways? Yeah, I mean, I still get shit over it. People still, people like, oh, what band are you in this week? Or the the mis the misunderstanding or the 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 thing that I always bothered me is when people thought I would form a band and then leave it and then move on to something else. I was doing all these at the same time, so it wasn't like I ever, you know, left this band for that band. And and it, it was like, you know, bring it on. I'll do it all. You know, I think at the moment there's like ten different bands I'm part of. And they're just some are more active than others. Some are kind of taking a break. Some aren't. So, 
but yeah, I mean, I do feel vindicated in a way, you know, it's like, and like you said, I, I can't name almost anybody that only has one band these days. It's just, it's the norm now. Yeah. Yeah. The, totally. The, the side project I want to see is the, which uh, you could put together very easily is the Portnoy family band. Yeah. Because your whole family's musical. I, I can't believe you have not done a Portnoy family album. I, I tried as soon as COVID hit and we were all in lockdown, everybody started doing these like collaboration videos. And one of the first ones I wanted to do was one with my whole family. I wanted to do uh, the Ramon song, We're a Happy Family. And I couldn't convince the other, uh, the other gang, the rest of the gang to do it. So I ended up doing a version of it with me playing every instrument and the family was in the video with me. But yeah, it, it would have been a natural because Marlene plays guitar and recently started uh, playing again with, with her old thrash band, Mean Streak. Yep. They just did a whole tour with us with, with uh, John Petrucci. And Max plays, he has his own band, Tala, but he also plays drums for Code Orange now. So he's killing it out there. And then my daughter, Melody, is a singer. Uh, she does a lot of, you know, acting and theater and singing stuff. So, yeah, it is definitely a, a musical family. And but Code Orange is a big band. Yeah, yeah. Max is killing it with them. They have a new album coming out in September. It's their first album with him on drums and... He's been touring with them ever since, uh, I guess, two, 2021, ever since, you know, post-COVID touring began. So, yeah, he's killing it with them. He moved out to Pittsburgh to be with them full time now. Matt, uh, Mike, you didn't teach your son to play drums, really, right? He, I remember I remember it was at your house once, and, and uh, he told me he had a drum teacher for a little while. Yeah. But how much of what he knows and how good he is – came from the teacher just picking it up on his own, watching you, and did you, I'm sure you helped at some points, right? I mean, I, I'm i sure he, you know, being brought up in, a, in, a, in the lifestyle that I have surely influenced him. I mean, he was literally touring with me on the road with Dream Theater, uh, you know, when he was two years old, you know, and sitting behind the drums, eating, you know, candy, watching the show with my, you know, so he grew up around that, so I'm sure that had... Uh, had some kind of influence on him wanting to be a drummer himself. But but no, like you said, he, he was taking real lessons. And I think that was important because, A, I'm not a teacher. It doesn't matter how much I've played or how many awards I've won or whatever. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a drummer. So I can't really teach somebody the fundamentals and think in those terms. But the other thing is that I, I tour so much and I'm away so much. He needed somebody that he could consistently go to. So he was taking lessons for a few years from a, a local guy and – I think, you know, that's a big part of what got him really musical, able to read music and, you know, do a lot of the things he's able to do. I was at a I was at a Fourth of July party at Mike's house a few a number of years ago. And and Max was a, a kid then still before he was in any band. But I was talking to him and I remember saying to him, I'm like, um, so did your dad teach you? And he goes, no, no, I have a drum teacher. And I looked at him and I go does he know who your dad is? Like, I would imagine like the drum teacher would be like, I can't, you know, go there, you know, but uh, he's, you know, he, yeah, he, he's, it's amazing what he's turned into, man. It's yeah. really cool. Mike, did you ever go to one of his drum lessons and you were there sitting there? That must have intimidated that guy. Yeah. 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 I, used to, I used to, well, obviously Max was just a kid, so he would need a, to be driven to his lessons. So either me or Marlene were, were driving him every week and we'd have to sit there and yeah, he'd have to come out and, see me sitting there <laughs> but I mean, his teacher was great man i gotta give him all the credit in the world he was a freaking awesome teacher mike could get the most talented musicians of all time to play with him billy sheehan richie Kotzen, neil morse but he can't get members of his own family to be in the band with him. <laughs> should have just said i'll They're take away your iphones kids if you don't join the band well dot dot <laughs> <laughs> there it is yeah. Well, Don, maybe you can get Mike Morris in his band. He can't get yeah, he can, he can, he can yeah. me all. That's yeah. <laughs> well, if you look up where a happy Mike Portnoy, we're a happy family. You can see what I ended up doing. I ended up playing all the instruments myself, but it was fun. Hey, hey Mike, Mike, you're wearing. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was just yeah. same question. He's wearing a Pantera shirt. I was going to ask him. Yeah, did you yeah. see him? Did you see the new Pantera? Yet? Yeah, yeah. I, I caught uh, the show in Reading, Pennsylvania. It was freaking phenomenal. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I'm going to see him for the first time in uh, in about a week and a half at Rocklahoma. So they're headlining one of the days. So that'll be my first time seeing this. Yeah, this I mean, Char Charlie and Zach are absolutely killing it, really. Uh, I couldn't be happier for them. And 
Uh, I think all the the naysayers that c- came in this skeptical at the beginning are now kind of eating their words yeah. and realizing how badass this is and uh, how important it is, you know, to keep that legacy alive. You know, I know it was a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow, but I think the reality is if Dimebag uh, hadn't been killed, I think they surely would have reunited at some point by now. And I understand Vinny's not want, you know, once Dimebag was killed, I understand Vinny never wanting to do it without him. You know, it's his brother. So I get that. But now that Vinny isn't with us either, you know, it's Phil and Rex's band as well to, you know, and I think, you know, wanting to carry on the legacy for a whole new generation is, is a great, great thing. You know, they're, they're an important band and important to metal and, and uh, why shouldn't they be out there doing it? You know, yeah, they, especially you they're know. doing it so tastefully and with so much, uh, you know, honor and respect to dime and Vinny. you know they're there each and every show right there on charlie's bass drum heads so i think it's they're doing it right they would have definitely gotten to back together i know they were working on a second damage plan record at the time but they definitely they oh, wanted yeah. to be back in but also you know i was talking to one of Vinny's buddies recently and he was saying you know Vinny would say I have no way i'm never playing with that guy again and he goes and he have a few more drinks he'd be like eh, maybe you know, for the fans. So he's like, he was going to eventually come around, Vinny. He thought too, if Vinny was still alive. I mean, I understand for him how hard it would have been because it, it was his brother that wasn't there. So I understand his take on it. But I, I think it was inevitable, you know, and I'm really glad to see how well it's doing. And Charlie and Zach are just doing it with so much respect and integrity, which is awesome. Hey, well, hey, it's my- cool. They, they've said consistently it's not Pantera yet. Even though it is in name, it's it it can't be, but it's a celebration of the music, and I think that is the right tone to take with it. Why is Charlie wearing a three on the back of his shirt every night? Do you know what the significance of that is? Dime's favorite number. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I, know that. I think even if you look at those old uh, Pantera home videos, there's one of them, I think, well, the third one, they, Dimebag does a whole thing in the beginning, a big montage of everybody saying three, 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 three. That was a big thing for him. But it was also a Peter Chris thing, if you remember. I Peter know. Had, that's, and I know yeah. Charlie's a huge Kiss fan, so I didn't right. know. But that wouldn't make sense to do it a Pantera thing. That's why I wasn't sure. Right. Hey, hey Mike, was your, was your name ever thrown into the mix for, for that drum spot? You'd have to ask those guys. I have no idea. I mean, obviously, I, I, I would have done it in a heartbeat if asked, but Charlie is absolutely – the right guy for the gig and he's doing it he's doing a great great job and uh i don't think it was ever my gig to be had it was always charlie's as far as i'm concerned and uh i you know i've i've had the uh pleasure and the honor of already playing some of those pantera songs with phil and rex through the years with metal allegiance as we were just talking about because they've both done metal allegiance with us yeah. and uh some of the first times that phil had ever played any of those pantera songs uh, post Pantera were, were with us at Metal Allegiance. So I've already had the, the fun, you know, honor of getting to jam those tunes with, with those guys. And uh, that was enough for me. You know, Charlie's doing it right and I'm happy for him. Hey, Mike, what's going on with you now? So I know the Winery Dogs, the campaign for this record has been amazing and taking you all over the world. The record, the tour, everything was well received. What what's coming up next as far as your schedule? Which bands? Where are you where are you headed? What's coming down the pike? We still we still have another uh, pretty lo- pretty big leg coming up in uh, Europe, uh, but yeah, like you know, we've been out since February, and pretty much for all three of us, the focus has been the Winery Dogs. Billy just did a, a Mr. Big farewell tour in Asia, but for the most part, all three of us have just been all about the Winery Dogs, and we still have. Uh, a European leg in October, November, and then we have uh, five shows in Japan at the end of November. And there's talk of carrying into next year as well because it's been so well received and, you know, most of the shows have sold out and we want to be able to do, do some festivals and try to hit the festival circuit a little bit more next year. So if those opportunities arise, we're going we're gonna to keep going into next year. So we'll see. Mike, any uh, flying circus dates? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there it is. Yeah, Flying there Colors <laughs> will be playing on Cruise to the Edge in March. I don't know about Flying Circus, but right. Flying Colors will be right. on Cruise to the Edge. <laughs> this is the most press this band has I ever know. gotten. 
<laughs> but, but I'm totally saying that looks like a band that should be on Cruise to the Edge right. and that totally Mike should be in. It really does. It looks like the guy from Marillion is in there or something, right. like the yeah. whole thing. Oh, my God. Mike, you like um, doing those cruises? I do, yeah. I mean, oh, uh, yeah. you know, like over the last 10 years or so, I've probably done about a dozen between Cruise to the Edge and I've done the Monsters of Rock one a bunch of times. And I even did my own one um, progressive nation at sea back in 2014 so uh yeah. you know yeah it's ended up it's become like kind of a common thing for most bands to do these days and it's a great 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 way to get out there and play and play to a lot of different people and play with a lot of bands and get some uh rest and relaxation and vacation as well and watch uh, all the other bands too yeah, totally. all the other bands of the ship which is great yeah i've been on a few uh i've done my radio show from a few of the crews to the edges and i use mike as my wingman because he can educate me on some of that stuff because i don't know it all too well and it's it's good to explore it and learn about it and then having mike there is like the ambassador of it is is awesome so that's that's cool so mike it sounds like just winery dog stuff for you pretty much the rest of the way here yeah i mean that's it for the rest of the year i have a couple of weird one-off things I'm, I'm actually playing drums for the uh seattle seahawks drum line on september 24th so that'll be pretty interesting. They they guess they have guest drummers, I guess, occasionally. Charlie's done it, and Chad Smith has done it, and John Tempesta. So they invited me out, so I'll be doing that in Seattle. And then uh, I have the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp in, uh, I think, November. I'm doing that with Zach Wilde and Marty Friedman. And then uh, another cool one-off thing. I don't know how much you've talked about it, Eddie, but I have uh, a little shindig uh, – with yeah, you. no, 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 nothing, 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 I don't know what you're talking about, nothing, uh, I, zip, zip, what about the, yeah, what about the Mike Morse band, the yeah. Mike Morse band, I actually just got home from playing with the Mike Morse band, we did, uh, we did this thing called Morse Fest every year, and I just played with Mike this past weekend, so yeah, just yeah. kind of one-off stuff for the moment, and that's it for now. Yeah, that thing Mike talked about we'll announce after Labor Day. But uh, I just hope Flying coming. Circus is going to be on that thing whenever yeah, it gets yeah. announced. Yeah. Hey, Mike, one last thing before <laughs> we let you go. We can't have you on and not talk about Dream Theater. Um, you know, I think it's really. Yes, we can. could. We could. Eddie. Yeah, yeah, no, could. no, 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 where you're at with them now. The fact that you guys are all cool, people people that don't know you went out and played with John Petrucci, you were on his record, you toured with him, we you did stuff with up. Jordan, you went to go see Dream question. Theater play. I think that's really cool. It's got to feel good and like I think some sort of closure maybe for the fans after all those years to be able to say where things are at with those guys now with you. Yeah, that's true. I'm busting your chops, but it, it really does feel good to be at such a good place with them. In fact, I just saw uh, John Petrucci and John Myung just came to Marlene's uh, surprise birthday party just a few nights ago. So, I, you know, I was with those two guys just a few nights ago. And yeah, it does feel good. You know, it feels like, um, you know, they're, they're family. We're, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of the three of us forming the band. Uh, you know, so after 40, you know, almost 40 years you can't not have that connection. You know, uh, you know, our wives play together in Mean Streak and they've reunited after all this time. And my daughter and John Petrucci's daughter have lived together in an apartment for the last four years in Brooklyn. So they're roommates. There's just such a family connection between me and, and those guys that, that that's never going to go away, whether or not I'm in the band. But but now to be even playing music together, you know, John and Jordan and myself did a third liquid tension album which was a big big deal for us and doing john's tour uh you know being on stage together after all these years it's it's been really really um really really nice you know it's just a, there is a certain sense of closure you know the fans are going to still inevitably always be wanting a reunion or talking about it whether whether or not you know you know it's hypothetical at this point but inevitably is some that's a, a question or a discussion that will never go away you know it, it's inevitable as you know when you like a band like that that you're gonna talk about it so i get it but for me i have a tremendous amount of closure just to be on such a great level with those guys personally and to make music in the capacity that we do now we mike, had, i'm, uh, I'm we sorry had, my co-host made you uncomfortable with that question <laughs> we had 
we had Petrucci and um, at least there's one professional here that knows the question to ask. Um, we, we had uh, Petrucci and Jordan on earlier and half the time we talked about John's beard and the beard right. products he's now selling. Yeah, so yeah. he's got a serious beard game going <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, he, he gave me tips on mine, so it was good. Yeah. yeah Jim said he's only growing his Jim, to I like cover. It. Jim, Jim said he only cover, grew his to cover his double chin, which means I better start growing real yeah. quick. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. big time. That's a big aspect. <laughs> <laughs> now we're all in. Look at that. And we're all in. We're the and one Mike guy on the far right, Morris. though. And the real Mike Morris is in there. Oh, that's what that's he that was? guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Mike Morris all the way far right. <laughs> Look. It's the new super group. That's funny. Super hey, super. we should play. Um, yeah, we should finish out the show with Mike because we got to do this versus that. And do you want to do the death metal logo? Mike, can yeah. maybe help with that? Look. Yeah. All right. So, Mike, so just so you know, we got a couple features that we do in this show. Every week, Don gives me a death metal logo that I have to try to read what it says. <laughs> and then we end with basically this versus that, which we pick two things which we need to, to close out with. But let's do the death metal logo now. Maybe Mike can. Is it, it going to be a Mike pile of twigs? I've well, seen it, always, it always is, but yeah. sometimes it throws. <laughs> I'm gonna get. Uh, I'm gonna fly. Fly in circus. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's I don't think insane, so. Don. <laughs> that's so really a real logo. It, yeah, it's great too. But people really are digging this segment because now fans are sending these to me all the time. Wow. So this is from a fan, Jackie Ray, who sent this. It is a real band, and uh, I. <laughs> it's not a. It's a made up word. But the first part of the word is a word you would associate with death metal, if that helps. <laughs> it it almost looks me. like an S. Is it an S starting it? No. It's not an S? Yeah, I thought it was an S and a Y at the end. but uh, it, it is a Y at the end, Mike. Is there a C in the middle? A C and an R? <laughs> it's, what is that show, Wheel of Fortune? Can I get a C? I <laughs> it almost like, looks like an outtake to a Metallica load. Cover yeah, right. yeah. with the blood and the semen. That's, yeah, that's not an S, Dom. It is not, but there is a Y and there is an R. Is, is it, it a is P? The first letter a C? <laughs> There's no C. Wow. Uh, I, I that's the hardest one you've hit me with yet, Dom. <laughs> yeah. One of the comments says Satan's ball sack. I, I, I that's my guess. But it's not an S. I thought it was an S too, and I was going to go Satan. But it's it's not an S. He said, "It is not. It's a it's a band called Gora, Goratory." And so that's a G. That's a G at the beginning. Goratory, and they have uh, a lot of big hits. Uh, totally, <laughs> totally clips of the fart. Um, pig pepper. Golden Shower Gladiators, uh, Cream of Fetus, and Cottage <laughs> Cheese, C-Word are some of their bigger hits. I'm surprised you haven't heard of them. Do you have that on vinyl, Don? <laughs> no, but if I find it, I'll buy it. Please, get two. I'd love one as well. <laughs> my, my favorite unused metal band name is Rumpled Foreskin. <laughs> you just gave it away now on YouTube. Forget it. There's gonna be three bands tomorrow. Yeah. Gen genital giant. That's a good one. <laughs> genital um, band. All right. So Don, you told you said that um you wanted to do this debate with Mike for this versus that, right? Well, we got a drummer on who uh who I like who loves the band Iron Maiden, like we all do. And so I figured let's put a couple Iron Maiden drummers up against each other. It's tougher when they're beloved, but you got to pick one, Mike. Right. Um, are you more of a Clive Burr fan or are you more of a Nico McBrain fan? And you will go last, Mike, and you'll set everybody straight. And we'll start at the top with Eddie and we'll get his pick. I love what Clive did. I think Clive was very unique in his sound with Iron Maiden. Uh, I saw Maiden with Clive because I saw the Killers tour and the Number of the Beast tour. But I just, I got to, I mean, unfortunately, the body of work for Clive is much smaller. It's only three records. Sadly, Clive passed away, so he really didn't do too much after Maiden. 
I did a couple things, but not a lot. I think at Widowmaker. this point, you guys mentioned Widowmaker. Widowmaker, earlier. yeah, yeah. I just, I just feel like Nico is the guy when you talk about Iron Maiden drummers, and from peace of mind on, he's been there. He's been through everything. He recently revealed he had a stroke, and he's still back there playing. And just listening to the beginning of Where Eagles Dare, which was the first song on the first record he was on, that just laid the gauntlet down. And uh, <clears throat> although I love what Clive did because it was kind of different, I think Nico is the guy. All right, Jim. Um, what did Clive die of again? I forget. MS. Yeah, MS. Well, oh, okay. Um, you know, I saw Cl I saw Clive probably three times too. We, I think all three of us were at the same Maiden pre-show at Asbury Park Convention Hall. Yeah. Back in the day, but Nico, same. Where he goes, there is my favorite Maiden song. To open that record with him on there, that drumming on there. I mean, look, Mike's gonna know because he's more he he knows drums, but I'm gonna go with Nico too. Jim, you suck. That's all I'm saying right now, and nobody knows why I'm saying that, but you and Don, but you suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, You're killing me. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, this, this is a great way. We do need a break after this show. Oh, you, it's a callback to something from our old show, but I'm not going to go there. Go all ahead, right. Don. Yes, Eddie. I, I, yes. Nico benefits from having a bigger body of work, of course, and, and, and we love Nico. And it's, but he's a very different drummer than Clive. Um, I, I just, I, you know, maybe it's, you know, your first love, you, you never get over it. Uh, to me, I, Clive's, you know, drumming is very unique. I love, I love how he uses his snare drum uh, to do fills, you know, um, as opposed to doing the big drum rolls and all that stuff, which he also did. But he, he was real creative with his snare drum. You know, Lars Ulrich even says the same thing. That's why Lars is very creative with a snare drum that comes from Clive Burr. Um, he was the original guy in the band. I'm going, Cl and he's got the best hair. Um, yeah. So I'm going with Clive Burr. Real quick, and I don't remember this, did Clive play single bass or double bass drums? Single. They both, both single bass drummers. Oh, Nico yeah. doesn't play double bass? No. Doesn't oh, even wow. a, he doesn't even use the double pedal. I did not know that. Yeah. All right, Mike. Well, you're, the, you're in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame, so you set yeah. the record straight. Well, look, they're both amazing. They're both legendary. Uh, I mean, I'm partial to the first three albums. I love actually the first four or five albums because I love Peace of Mind and Power Slave as well. But the first three are just so incredible. Uh, and the drumming on all three albums is legendary. I mean, Clive had the, so many great legendary drum intros. The Prisoner, um, uh Run to the hills. Uh, what is another life? Was that another life? I can't remember, but yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's so many legendary drum parts. Um, but I gotta give it to Nico. Nico, he's been there. Oh, I thought you were going Clive the way you're setting that up. I'm gonna give Clive his his respect and do, and you know, but you gotta give it to Nico. He's Nico's been there for 40 years, you know, he's basically. You know, he's the drummer of Iron Maiden. He's the face of that band when you look at the drum kit. And uh, not to mention the fact that he's a very, very good friend of mine, so I could never not <laughs> pick him or else I'll never hear the end of it. But, uh, you know, he's, he's a good friend to all of ours, I'm sure. Plus, yeah, plus, uh, we wouldn't get free ribs at Rock and Roll yeah. Ribs if we <laughs> yeah. didn't pick yeah. him. Yeah. Well, I guess I won't be, but I'm hey, a vegetarian, so. Hey, Mike, how difficult you think it was when he said that the last tour, he was only 70%. Yeah, back from his stroke to play like a two-hour show. Yeah, um, I mean, amazing. You know, any any bands that are in that age bracket. I don't. I don't know if he's hit seventy yet, but most of the he metal is. bands. Yeah, most metal artists are now upper sixties, getting into their seventies. It's one thing for the Stones to go out there and play. You know, you know, start me up or paint it black at eighty years old. But once you start getting into, you know. You know, playing where Eagles Dare or Steve Harris being able to play, you know, Murders in the Room Org or, you know, Phantom of the Opera. You know, metal musicians up in that age bracket, it's going to start to take its toll. And, uh, you know, I didn't see any footage from uh, of, of him post stroke, but I did play with those guys in Rock and Rio last year and he sounded as great as ever. You know, he's, he's, he's just always been rock solid for all these years, all these decades. He he got sober a few years ago, which he said really helped him. 
And he, I remember him telling me on my radio show, he said that, and this was a while ago, that he's the oldest member of the band, and obviously drumming is so physical. And he said that he told Steve Harris, look, if I'm lagging or I'm messing you guys up or I'm not bringing it, I'm not cutting it, please, he said, don't leave me out here to die. He goes, put me out to pasture. It's all good. I'm cool with it. And he said Steve hasn't put him out to pasture yet, so he's going to just keep hanging in there. That's but right. yeah, it's pretty remarkable what he's doing still at his age. And he looks great. And he, he got, like I said, ever since he got sober, I think like five, six years ago, he said that's really helped his stamina and how he feels a whole lot more too. So uh, he, definitely, you know, definitely still chugging along. He had that great story about how his wife was getting on his case because he was drinking on the road. So like the first night of the tour, he had this huge glass with beer, like, huge super tall and he's walking around with like what are you doing with that he goes my wife said i can have one beer uh, so he put it in like a 64 ounce <laughs> jenny's just walking around like, i can have one beer that's the other thing about him he's a total <laughs> character and the most fun guy to talk to definitely yep. the and i mean this i love all the maiden guys but he's definitely the most personable big personality guy in that band he's the guy they send out into the after party to entertain everybody when they just want to get on the bus or the plane and get out of there so He's yeah. great in that that role as well. Uh, oh, Mike, we got to wrap it. Anything you want to plug or mention before we go? No, that's it. You know, uh, just more, a little more winery dogs on the horizon and, uh, you know, a bunch of one-off stuff, and that's about it. I'm, I'm mainly here to just bust your chops. I don't want to talk about myself. I want to talk about, uh, <laughs> you know, side, you know, whatever the whatever the topics are today. That's uh, that's what yeah. I miss with you guys. I'm so happy to see you guys doing this again, and uh, thanks for having me for sure. Yeah, Thanks, man. Well, we're glad we can make it happen, and we'll definitely have to do it again. And we still uh, don't have that the... UFO tattoo, though. <laughs> still no that was, I think, from the very. That was like one of the very, very first episodes. Yeah, it right. was. And you, still it was. That was one. the first time they, 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 you know, bit where they tried to get me. I remember that. But yeah, still no ink. I'm still ink free. So. Yeah. Anyway, man. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Best to the family, and uh, we'll talk yeah. soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Mike. Later See on. You, Mike. Appreciate it, man. Bye-bye. There he goes, Great everybody. Team. Mike Portnoy, one of our good buddies and uh, one of the best guys, best drummers out there. And, yeah, he, he caught a lot of flack for leaving the band, wanting to do all these other bands. And I, I remember it. I mean, we were, we've were we been friends for a long time, and we've traveled together and been to the house. And it was a rough road there for, for a bit after he was first out of Dream Theater. And there was a lot of backlash, a lot of crazy stuff that went on. And in my opinion, I mean, he's totally been uh, – vindicated with that because everybody now has multiple bands outside of their main band so it's be, always it's multiple. become the norm always, always multiple. can't you just can't you just have one band we're doing uh andrew dice clay impressions who uh is all three of our favorite comics for it's our favorite comic all three of us we share that and i'm excited because i've not seen dice in a long time and i plan to try to go see him tomorrow night in new jersey so i'm very yeah. excited about that. It's been. I'll, a pro I'll probably meet you for that, Ed. And he, he yeah. opened for Guns N' Roses at MetLife Stadium. Yeah. The other night, yeah. like he last went week, out he went his out. filthy jokes. Yeah, his for poems. Like Fifty thousand people. Yeah, it's great. Amazing. Oh my god. Well, the one right. good thing, one the good thing we could say, there's been no technical difficulties during the show. Everything else was a disaster, but <laughs> no mic problems or camera problems. All right, we got our, we got that rocks T-shirts. We got the three X's back in. All right. So Save me we were out of them. So yeah, that rocks. Go to merchmountain.com. Get your t-shirts. And uh, yeah, check out my show every Thursday on Ozzy's Boneyard. Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern. And my podcast, Everybody is Awful, comes out every Monday. All right. Uh, just find me on my social media. September 24th, New York City, McSorley's. No sleep till McSorley's comedy taping go to brownpapertickets.com for free tickets and every day sirius xm i had an epic meltdown today if you guys heard it if not go listen to it on the app about a 50 greatest singers list but every day you can hear me go off about rock music live three to five eastern on faction talk 103 or on the sirius xm app uh podcast six show on sirius xm syndicated show Next appearance, we'll be hosting Rocklahoma Labor Day weekend. And we should mention, with that in mind, again, a reminder, we are off next week because of the holiday week. 
We will keep you posted on when we will return. It'll be in the following week. We'll let you know the day and the time and the guest. So be sure to follow our social medias for that. And be sure to also follow the show's account, which is That Rock Show on all the social media. So uh, just taking a week off, resetting. As you can see, we're such a fine, well-tuned machine moving so, so smoothly now. We just need, we just can't believe how well we're doing. We got to take a second yeah. to regroup here. So we'll be back in a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing, uh, you guys check us out on the after show. Join uh, the membership. It's right there, right? The link is right there, Joe, for people to join. Yes, right below the video, there's a button that says join. You just have to click that button and sign up. And we'll do, we'll come back to you guys in a few minutes for our members, and we'll do another 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, maybe Every we'll week do, it gets longer. 20, 30 minutes. We're doing yeah. another three hours. You never know. Well, let's do no, our we'll we're do gonna our do picks. 10 minutes. We'll yeah, do we'll, we'll do our picks in the, the no, we'll Oh, start. we didn't right. do our picks. Another week without the picks. We'll do it in the other show. All right. There, All right. A little something, see. something for the members. And become a member if you're not, like Jim said, just hit the button. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mike Portnoy. Labor Week. <laughs> <laughs>